Can I just go on record and say something that I think we can all agree about? 2020 is a, a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad year. And, and I think we'd all agree with that statement. Even if we might not all agree sometimes on how to make 2020 become a better year. Like there's tons of disagreement about that. But I dislike 2020, and I bet you dislike 2020. And if we agreed on nothing else, we'd have solid ground to stand on already. We'd have some unity. 2020 is no fun. Yet even as bad as 2020 is, have you ever stopped to think and marvel at the, the minor miracle, or maybe it should be a large miracle that 2020 has also been? Because I mean, think about it. We have Fortune 500 companies being run entirely from people's homes. We have schools being run entirely from people's homes, as I have a wife and kids in education. We have Supreme Court cases being heard and ruled on entirely from people's homes. Toilet flushes and all. Uh, we have never been more equipped to deal with 2020 than we are in 2020. And the best part of this is that if you are, say, 30 years old or older, you've gotten to experience the fullness of how we got here. You see, I'm old enough to remember a life before the internet, before email, before social media, before YouTube. Like I remember when those volumes of, of Encyclopedia Britannica on the shelves were the only hope I had of writing that report on Italy that I once wrote. I remember when typing that report meant borrowing someone's typewriter for the first time. And yet in about 1996, life for me began to change as we fired up that first Windows 95 computer that we got with its 33.6 kilobyte per second modem, and we heard that familiar modem sound and entered into a new world that would fundamentally change the course of my life and everyone else's life in the world over time. And so little by little, I watched as, as one friend got online and another friend got online and another friend got online, and I, I watched as aunts and uncles and grandparents all slowly began to connect to the internet for the first time and have that, that light bulb moment of like, wow, this is really amazing. And if you could picture what that era was like in a map or a photograph or maybe a video, you'd see these dark places begin to suddenly illuminate, that the world would illuminate little by little over four or five years until most of the entire globe was lit up. It, it was the dawn of the information age that we've all come to know and experience. An age that allows us to ask questions of the phones in our pockets and receive immediate answers spoken to us to almost all of life's trivial questions. Like, it's, it's amazing that we've lived through what we've lived through when you really think about it. And it's because of what took place, say, 20 years ago, that when a pandemic hits, as, as bad and as inconvenient as it is, the world just marches on, albeit with some significant speed bumps. But we're able to, to gather here today as the church to worship Jesus together. You know, 2020 may be awful, but consider how amazing it is that we are watching and singing and chatting and worshiping together right now, even as we cannot gather together. If you're joining us for the first time today, we are moving closer to the end of our One Kingdom Indivisible sermon series. It's a, a series preached by dozens of churches all around the Bay Area who decided to, to link arms in a show of unity and remind ourselves that the church was always supposed to be a united group of God's people. You know, thus far we've talked about things like creation and exodus and we've, about exile and about the gospel. And now finally this week, we've come to the, the part of the series where we talk about the church. I mean, certainly this entire series has ultimately been about the church, but this morning more than ever, it, it is our purpose to rediscover, if you will, who the church is, to rediscover what the church was commissioned to do. You know, last week as we discussed the gospel, we discovered what that really meant, that it was not just a proclamation of, of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, but that it, it was kingdom language, that from within the earthly kingdoms of this world, Jesus arrived and he was proclaiming the good news of a new kingdom and a new king. And as Jesus walked from town to town, from synagogue to synagogue, 
He kept telling anyone who would listen that the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God had come near. It was more than some some future destination that people would escape to after they died. It, It was both already and not yet. That the kingdom of heaven was at hand and Jesus is its king. It was an upside down kind of kingdom built not on oppressive authority, not on taxation, not on war, but a kingdom of service, of sacrifice, of love, of giving, and of peace. And all along the way, the Gospels remind us of one powerful and simple truth set over and above the kingdoms of this world. And that truth was this. Only Jesus has the power to save. And so as the Gospels come to a close and the the post-resurrection era of Jesus' followers uh, begins, the the mission for them or their purpose is spelled out in incredible or immaculate detail. Jesus says, all authority or all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. What what Jesus spoke to them that day was was a common mission and a common purpose. It was was rooted in unity. And so when you think of, of organizations in our world today, basically every single one of them has a mission statement of some kind. Some are really good, some are not so good, but these statements provide something of a a true north for the company. Something that that they can can link on to and and keep them focused. Like Google's mission, for instance, is to, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Apple's is to bring the best user experience to its customers through its innovative hardware, software, and services. Uh, SpaceX, their mission is to revolutionize space technology with the ultimate goal of enabling people to live on other planets. And so Jesus' mission statement to his disciples was, go and make Jesus followers in, in all nations and in all places and teach them to obey Jesus' commands and, and baptize them. Like that was the true north. That was the, the guiding mission to the early church. And it remains our mission to this day. And I want you to pay special attention here because what you won't see in, in anything Jesus says is that all disciples or all Christians should think or look or behave or act in exactly the same way. Rather, Jesus calls us to a united mission. And so as we've talked about extensively in this series, he calls us to unity, but but unity never meant conformity. And it it certainly never meant that the church was immune to differences of opinion about how to accomplish that mission. And so as we think about themes like, like power and light as it relates to Jesus' message, I would be remiss to not remember the the history of power and light as we know it today. There's light and power in this room. Well, in the late 1870s, the famed American inventor Thomas Edison uh, had a light bulb moment for a revolutionary new invention, the light bulb. And yet without a system to supply electricity to that light bulb, it was pretty much useless. And so in, in 1882, he developed his first power plant in New York City that formed as a a small circuit of power that could be used to provide electricity and subsequently light to the very first city and community on Earth. Think about that. Every other place on Earth was dark, but New York City could finally start to light up at night. It, It was small, but it was something. And so for the first time in world history, there was light. Even at night, there was light in the darkness. I want you to think about how much we take that for granted today, but that was, that was only 150 years ago. And so nevertheless, Edison had a problem because it just wasn't very practical to, to use his technology because the, the low voltage direct current or DC electricity that he was providing 
well, it couldn't be transmitted for very long distances, which meant that every mile or so, there'd have to be some new power plant. Well, the United States just happens to be 3.8 million square miles. And so it, it would get really, really expensive really, really quickly to provide that kind of power uh, needed to light everything in the country. But there was, however, a, a different thought about how to bring costs down and how to accomplish that goal. Because a man who was working for him at the time named Nikola Tesla had a slightly different idea than Edison did. And what Tesla suggested was that instead of using direct current, they could use alternating current or AC electricity, which could be transmitted over much longer distances. And so Edison heard him, but Edison disagreed, claiming that, that AC posed a safety issue that his DC methods did not. So Edison was sold on DC, Tesla was sold on AC, and soon after Tesla left Edison to partner with George Westinghouse, who would ultimately uh, compete with and eventually defeat Edison's system. And so sure enough, the, the power that you are using right now to watch this service, or the power that we are using in this room right now to illuminate everything we're doing was brought to you by Tesla's alternating current. And so in the current wars, Tesla came out on top. Tesla was victorious. But here's the thing, and this is why I tell that story or, or that bit of history, if you will, because Edison and Tesla had the same mission, didn't they? They wanted to illuminate the world. They wanted to bring light into the darkness and while their methods may have been different, their, their mission was still the same. Their, their unity of mission never necessitated conformity of thought. And I think this is an important issue or, or theme for us to highlight or explore a little bit more as part of this series because of how much the church today can find itself suffering from such a vast diversity of thought. Like it, it can all feel very divided and very toxic and very unhealthy. And so it would be easy for us to glamorize the early days of the early church in the book of Acts. And frankly, this is something that we often do. Uh, if you have a Bible with you, we're going to read out of Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And here the text says that the, the early disciples devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they, they broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, we, we read that and we love the image of camaraderie and community and unity that it, it paints in our minds, often without the context of the hard work that comes shortly thereafter. But there's many examples of exactly that kind of hard, messy work in the life of the church. Examples of confrontation, examples of disagreement. I think first of, of the Apostle Paul's letter to the, to the Galatian church. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul describes how he confronted the apostle Peter because Peter was behaving in a way that he frankly shouldn't have been behaving toward non-Jewish Christians or, or Gentiles. And so Paul writes in verse 11, he says, when, when Peter came to Antioch, he says, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Or, or in Acts chapter 15, the apostle Paul and his, his partner Barnabas at the time have a disagreement about who should or, or who should not accompany them as they travel to live out the mission statement that Jesus gave them. And so in, in verse 36, it says, Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Hey, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preached the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. It says Barnabas wanted to take John, or also called Mark, with him, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, 
But Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the believers to the grace of the Lord, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Now, were Paul and Barnabas at, at war with one another based on what we just read? No. Uh, did they have a different mission that they were trying to fulfill? No. Both men were, were still committed to living out the mission of Jesus. Uh, what they disagreed about were the methods. They disagreed about how to live out the mission in the very best way. And so on the surface, it, it's not the beautiful picture that seems to be portrayed by the, of the church in Acts chapter 2 that we just read a few moments ago, where it's, it's easy to fantasize about and, and build up the ease and the simplicity of what life of the church must have been like. But what Acts 15 does show us is something more mature, it's something more developed, it's something more consistent with the, the cost of fulfilling any mission statement in our world today. Uh, and Google is a, is a great example. Like Google is great at what Google does, and Apple is great at what Apple does, and SpaceX is great at what SpaceX does. But none of those organizations have succeeded without some Acts 15 moments. In fact, Apple's Acts 15 story is front and center in any Steve Jobs biography that was ever written. He was fired from his own company. And then he was brought back. And, and I bring all that up because I, I want to introduce the story that I'm about to share. Uh, before I, I tie all of this back into the, the church's current reality that we're experiencing and facing today. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, open up to Romans chapter 14, if you would. Uh, Romans is a letter that is written by the Apostle Paul, yet again, uh, this time to the early church, the, the, the early Christians living in the city of Rome. And on the surface, this appears to be just a text about, hey, how to understand kosher food laws and what, were, what was handed down way back when in the days of, Levit of Leviticus uh, that, that Moses wrote. But while that may be the issue for Paul's discussion, that's not the spirit of what Paul's addressing as he writes this. And so the context for, for this portion of Paul's letters, or letter, is that the, the church was now comprised of, of kind of two main people groups. There were practicing Jewish believers, and then there were practicing non-Jewish believers or Gentiles. And so there's apparently some disagreement, there's some quarreling happening, particularly over what is allowable for them to eat and what is not allowable for them to eat. Uh, elsewhere, there are, there are similar discussions over things like, like circumcision and Sabbath. And so you, you'd think that, that Paul would come in and he would kind of write to them and set the record straight, like, oh, well, this, is, this is what you all can eat and this is what you cannot eat. Done deal, end of story, like have a good day. You kind of expect that that's what he might do. But that's not at all what Paul does here. Because Paul understands something uh, something profound about the Jewish believers, about that community, because he is one. He understands that one of the biggest parts of a Jewish person's identity are their dietary laws and their restrictions. It's, it's, it's kind of what makes them who they are in a sense. It's what has set them apart and made them holy and made them unique as God's people for thousands of years. They have, they have deep-seated convictions about food. You don't just let go of that stuff. But Gentiles weren't brought up that way. And good chance you and I were not brought, that, uh, brought up that way. Nor does it seem to be required of Christian believers any longer. So what do we do? What is to be done? Well, that's kind of the heart of what Romans 14 and 15 addresses as, as Paul sits down and puts pen to paper. And this is what he says. Romans 14, beginning in verse 1, the text says, Except the one whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat the, with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall, and they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. In other words, it's not for one person with, with one conviction to condemn the other person with a different conviction about what is the right way or the wrong way to serve God. Why? 
because they serve God. Like he's their king and he's able to make both of them, both of them stand before him as redeemed. And so he goes on to talk about, about holy days next as another example of, of differing thought. And so he says in verse six, whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. Paul reminds the readers that there may be different methods along the way, different ways of honoring God, but, but who exactly are they both honoring in the end? He's saying, hey, you guys are both honoring God. And so in verse 10, he says, you then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you, why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Okay, so Paul's reminding them that, that sometimes people will have different methods. Sometimes people will have different convictions some may be conservative about the behaviors that they feel are appropriate for a person of God. And others might be more liberal with their understanding about what kinds of behavior is allowed or appropriate for people of God. But at the end of the day, they don't stand in judgment before one another. And they don't stand in judgment before mankind. That if God is the Lord of each person, it's, it's, frankly, it's up to him to judge the hearts of each person. And I think this is an important lesson that the church often forgets, don't we? You know, we? We often forget that unity doesn't mean conformity. We forget that being a follower of Jesus isn't always precisely spelled out in every instance on exactly what to do. We forget that the grace of Christ is there to cover over a multitude of sins, whatever they might be. You know, I've, I've often lamented that, that Christians of, of every stripe of every shape, of every color, will proclaim that Christ's grace and his forgiveness is sufficient for each and every one of us, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been. And, and we often behave like that's the case, except in this one scenario. We often behave as though the, the grace of Jesus and the sufficiency of his grace and the power of the cross is sufficient insofar as, it, as you're not dealing with poor doctrine. But, but all of a sudden it becomes insufficient to cover poor doctrine or poor theology. And in that we kind of forget that for thousands of years, Christians didn't exactly have Bibles on their shelves to study every night and every morning when they got up. And so that means that somewhere along the way, a lot of well-meaning followers of Jesus, people who have given their heart and soul to him, have, have probably gotten it wrong and will get it wrong from time to time. They will, they will say and they will teach things that may not be true. They may even accidentally be a heretic. <laughs> they may say something heretical. But at the end of the day, God knows if they've done all of this uh, according to their heart, that w why they've done what they've done. He knows if, if they've done it for the Lord. That's, that's a, a quote taken straight out of Acts here. He knows, that, or, I'm sorry, Romans. He knows if they've done it for the Lord. And so Paul reminds readers that, that each person should be fully convinced in their own mind. But the rest is kind of left to God to work out. And so verse 13 begins to, to paint a picture of what disagreeing followers of Jesus ought to begin to do instead. He says in verse 13, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. I am convinced, he says, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you're no longer acting in love. Do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ has died. And so Paul, Paul reminds them that their, their first priority is, is not about being right at the expense of the, of the faith of another. 
Instead, their first responsibility, their first priority is to love. If you are doing something that brings others genuine fear or genuine concern, it's unloving to keep doing those things. Don't do harm to them because you have a different understanding than they do. And this is where he ties it into everything that we've been talking about for the last two weeks. This is Romans 15, beginning in verse 17. He says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Let us therefore make every effort, make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. So church, what is the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God all about? It's about righteousness and peace and joy. It's about making every effort to do what leads to peace and, and mutual edification. It's about light shining in the darkness. The culmination of what it's all about is in Romans 15, 5. So that was 14 before. This is Romans 15. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. There's so much more I could say. There's so much more I want to say. But how do you say that all, all that needs to be said about the church in one week or in one message? You, you, you don't. You don't. What I hope to have shown you this morning is that the church has always been comprised of people with a wide array or spectrum of viewpoints. Always. But what we've often done with that in practice is not to unite around the, the common mission but to divide based on the merits of method. You know, we talked briefly about this in week two of this series, that the, the church is divided something like 40,000 times based on matters of doctrine and practices. Ironically enough, the, the origin of our church, the, the Churches of Christ, is that we, we began as a unity movement in precisely the same vein that Paul seems to describe here. Uh, in fact, two of the common mission statements, if you will, of our restoration heritage in its early days, believe it or not, are these. That we are Christians only, but not the only Christians. And in essentials, unity. In opinions, liberty. In all things, love. Those two statements sound right in line with Paul's heart here in Romans 14 and 15. That the methods may be different. But the mission was the same. The mission was to go and make disciples and to baptize and to teach others to obey Jesus' commands. And so despite how well or how poorly we've lived that out at times, that is our heritage here at Lake Merced. And I gotta say, I think we do this pretty well here in 2020 today. But that's my favorite part of our heritage. And that's why a guy named Alexander Campbell, a Scottish Presbyterian, and Barton W. Stone, a man whose Cane Ridge Revival in Kentucky reportedly featured people making sounds like dogs barking and whose bodies would jerk and hit the ground and make loud screams. Somehow those two guys linked arms in creating a church unity movement. Their methods were far different, but their mission was the same. You know, many of the days where, where Methodist and Baptist and Church of Christ and Presbyterian and so on might gather to debate doctrinal matters, a lot of those things are things of the past, uh, especially here in 2020. Yet within many church communities all throughout the country right now rages a different kind of divide, one we've, we've talked about at great length throughout the series thus far. 
It's, it's the divide along political partisan lines, where the, the church divides not over scripture, not, not over uh, you know, doctrine, but over political affiliations, over conspiracy theories, over presidential candidates, and so on. At first glance, it might appear that for this issue, everything we, we read in Romans 14 and 15 kind of doesn't really apply at all. But if that's the assumption or, or belief, I, I want to push back on that ever so slightly because here, here's the reality from my experience. Most everyone I know, most everyone I talk to, particularly in the church, votes in a way that is heavily influenced, almost exclusively influenced by their faith. And, and often Christians just can't seem to understand why some other Christian could could possibly read the same Bible, but vote in a different way than they do. And so, and I'm guilty of this. And, and so we look at various political issues that arise, whether they be you know, abortion or human rights or civil rights or LGBTQ rights or taxation or bureaucracy, and the list goes on and on and on. And we wonder, like, why isn't this clear? This is clear, isn't it? Doesn't the Bible address this? Isn't it obvious that such and such a party or such and such a candidate is the only person a Christian should vote for? And I think the answer, I have to say, is emphatically no. You know, for example, like for one Christian, the conviction of the sanctity of life might demand that abortion laws be overturned and that innocent life be protected. But for other Christians, the, the conviction of the sanctity of life might also demand that social services be provided to people, that immigrants and minorities are treated more humanely, that warfare and violence are a last resort, and, and so on. And so which is right? Don't both care about the sanctity of life? Don't both believe that God created humanity in his image and that it should be cared for and protected? Aren't both trying to vote according to their biblically rooted convictions? And, and this goes for nearly every partisan voting issue there is. That Christians of, of good intent and good conscience vote according to how they understand God's word and the convictions of their heart. And so would Paul, were he alive today, think it any more reasonable for the church to divide now than when he did when he wrote to the church in Rome? Or, or in the spirit of Romans 14:6. Do you think Paul might say, hey, whoever votes one way does so to the Lord, and whoever votes another way does so to the Lord, and whoever does not vote at all does so to the Lord? And would he in the same, uh, in the same way remind us that he, remind us of what he reminded them of, that, that our kingdom, that the kingdom of God is not about a matter of voting, but of righteousness and peace and joy in, in the Holy Spirit? And would he remind us, as he reminded them, to make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification? Because church, as I reflect on, on Romans 14 and 15, I really think so. You know, sometimes like Paul and Peter, Christians will oppose and they'll correct one another when they're wrong. When they're just plain wrong, they'll do that. But sometimes, and oftentimes, like Paul's letter to Rome, the, the, the church is a united kingdom of diverse people who believe in the same mission, but sometimes differ in, in their methods. And so in those moments where, where everything around us is darkness, where everything around us is contentious and divided and ugly, the, the church, the people of God, you and I, members of Christ's kingdom, are called to be light. We already know how dark this world can be. And politics right now, more than anything, brings out the darkness and ugliness of our world. But we, as God's people, are not called to be disciples of the ways of this world. We are called to be disciples of God's Son. And about God's Son, the Gospel of John says, In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. You and me, we are the church. We are the kingdom of God. And Jesus is our king. 
Our king is good news for this world because he is the light who has overcome all the darkness, all of it. There is no darkness that he cannot overcome. We should all be able to agree about that. And when there is a diversity of opinions, when there is disagreement, where, when there is a different implementation of the ways in which we bring God's glory, church, let us remember that the way that we shine the light of Christ and bring glory to him is to make every effort among one another to do what is loving, what is peaceful, what is mutually encouraging, what is good, and what builds each other up. The mission of the church, the mission that Jesus gave to all of us to go into all nations and make disciples was a mission not altogether unlike what happened in the days of Nikola Tesla and not altogether unlike what happened from 1995 to 2000 with the internet. When the church is living out our mission, as we are called, we are the kingdom. We are like, we are like yeast and we are like mustard seeds who emerge in dark places as people of light and we illuminate the small places in the world with hope and mercy and the grace of Christ. And so that same Apostle Peter, who Paul opposed to his face, later wrote something rather profound. He wrote to Christians, and he said this to them. He said, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Church, in the, in the years following Paul's confrontation with him, Peter's heart changed. And what we see now is an apostle of Jesus, far less concerned with the methods, but with the message and the mission to be light in the darkness and to illuminate the world. And that, my friends, is the heart of today's message. That when you ask yourself, what do all these stories and, and letters mean? What, what am I supposed to do with this? What is the church really about? It's that. Illuminate the world. Shine the light of Jesus in every dark place you can find. In politics, in racism, in human rights, and so many other struggles that are full of darkness. Your job and my job, our job as the church, is to shine light into that darkness because light always overcomes darkness. Church, illuminate the world. The methods you use to do so may vary from, from my methods, but the mission is clear. We go and we make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And so church, as you do that, remember to illuminate the world. Bring peace, bring love, bring mutual edification without excuse to every dark corner of your life. And if you've not become a disciple of Jesus, if you have not received the Holy Spirit through baptism, we want to invite you to that opportunity this morning. Would you email us at questions at lakemercedchurch.com? Man, we, we really want to walk with you on that journey to calling Christ both Lord and Savior. Church, thank you for joining us this week. We'll see you next time. Go, go therefore and illuminate the world. God bless you.